the Ledger cold storage device had a little bit of a stumble about two or three weeks ago where it came out and they talked about how they were going to have a recovery service for $9.99 per month and it was going to be available to everybody. Well, the way that they executed it may not have been fantastic, but the devil really is in the details. So what I tried to do was reach out and uh, Ledger got back to me and they brought on uh, Charles Guillemet and he is the chief technical officer, been there since 2017. And we had a discussion about why they did this, what is happening right now and where they are moving forward. So I'm going to uh, link this in and uh, you can watch that, uh, that, that video in a little bit. There is one thing, though, between the, the three questions. The first question, we talked about what would happen if everything was, uh, if there was a hack. And the second question, we talked about where is L1 and L2s and blockchain going. The third question was questions from uh, Twitter. And I, I really uh, asked those questions out of order. Really, what the question should be is the first one is, what would happen if Ledger uh, broke down and got uh, hacked? The second question should have been questions from Twitter. And the third question will be the overall, you know, what is going on with blockchain and looking at uh, ones, L1s or L0s, L1s and L2s. So I'm going to rearrange the interview to where it makes more sense. So without further ado, here is an interview with Ledger's Charles Guillemet, CTO. Yeah, thank you very much for having me, Ron. It's a pleasure. Right. Oh, yeah. So you guys are taking some heat lately. Let's be honest. That hasn't been uh, hopefully too difficult, but there's been some basic questions that have come about. And before we, we really break into it, I have to just start with, I think, the basic question, which would be this. What would happen if a hacker or a group of hackers was able to actually get in on your cold storage device, Ledger, and be able to transfer funds, essentially stealing them? What would happen in that case if that actually happened to Ledger? I think it's a good idea to start at a high level and work our way backwards. Yes, sure. Uh, to answer to this question, let me uh, take a step back first. Uh, what is really important in crypto is self-custody. It gives you the opportunity to really own your value and, and to be the only one owner of your value. To, you don't have to ask the permission to anyone uh, to own the value and to uh, transfer it. So this is something quite new and very, uh, very important. Um, so self-custody is important, but it comes with a lot of responsibility uh, because of different properties of uh, the blockchain. One of them is immutability. So that means if you uh, do a transaction to a wrong address, uh, there was nothing you can do to reverse this transaction. If an attacker gets an access to uh, your key, he uh, will drain your wallet. And again, there was nothing you can do uh, to retrieve your funds. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a big responsibility to uh, manage uh, your, your crypto. And you need to have uh, the proper tools uh, to do that. And this is what we are try trying to provide uh, to our users, the right tools for them uh, to uh, be in self-custody. And security is uh, the, the big thing that we are doing at Ledger. This is this is Ledger's mission, uh, security, and ease of use. Because if you have the, a very, very secure um, uh, solution, but no one can use it, then you don't solve uh, any problem. So this is the, the trade-off we always have to uh, keep in mind. We uh, started with a very, very, very secure uh, product. We want to continue having the same level of security, but we want to improve uh, the, the UX. Uh, back to your question. like. As of today, we have uh, sold more than 6 million devices. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a lot, um, especially people who are use, using our devices are not really uh, newcomers. They, they have more assets than uh, the, the general uh, Joe that comes into crypto, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, so th this represents a lot of uh, assets uh, if, you, if, you, if you take this into perspective. So if we had a very big uh, security issue on, on our product, that would be uh, that would be a, a disaster for for Ledger, for the users, but for the ecosystem as a whole. We have a big responsibility. Right, uh, I have to agree because I was thinking about this as everybody was was piling on when Ledger came out and said we're going to do a new system. And I, and I, for one, was one of those that piled on at first. And I took a look at it and said, well, technically, can this actually happen? And do I have to opt in? And we'll get into that in a second. But really what it comes down to is if 
if Ledger, if something happens and someone's able to break into your cold storage device and they're able to steal funds, and they can do that across the continuum, those six million wallets, essentially the crypto market will be crippled and Ledger will not exist. So I need everybody to understand that you're gonna to have to start with this as like the business level. If this happened at a business level, the whole business would collapse. So I'm pretty sure, I'm just gonna take a wild swing at it and think to myself, maybe security is paramount and we're trying to do that. Okay, so that um, would answer the first question. Charles, what do you yeah. wanna add there? No, I just want to add something like what you, what you said is really, really right. And every time I take a decision, every time Ledger takes a decision, we have this in mind. We, we can't fuck up. Like this is not something possible. Uh, we always need to be as secure as possible. And this is our, our North Star. All right. So Charles, thanks for that. Now let's get into questions from Twitter, which is if you don't uh, follow along on Twitter, it's a very nice, happy place. Nobody says anything negative. If you're not on Twitter, check it out. So there was this post that I put out and I said, hey, good news. I'm going to have Ledger on the show next week. What are your questions for them besides the obvious one as to why they're allowing seed phrases to be extracted and stored for $10 a month? Now, look, I'm just going to go on a limb here and I'm going to think I'm going to say to myself, Charles, I think that this was and we just talked about this. We were talking about mass adoption, right? For people like me and you, and you watching the video right now, because right now it's July 4th, it is 2023, the new people that are going to come in and pile in in the next bull run aren't here yet, but they are coming. And you know where they're going to come because you haven't heard from your friends in a long time, and all of a sudden they're going to talk about Bitcoin. When those people come, they're the ones that lose their passphrases and everything else. I'm not saying that everybody should, be, should, should do self-storage, but we can do it. As time goes on to onload them, maybe that's not a bad uh, situation for them to come in and they can have someone else offload. We do what we do. So Charles, I'm just going to guess that this was the plan, which was to try to onload on as many new people to come in so they don't lose their private keys. Later on, they can learn how to self-custody and you've got a solution for that, which is what we're at, we're at right now. But is, was that the plan with Ledger? Yeah. Again, what I said uh, as an introduction, the mission of Ledger is security and ease of use. Uh, as of today, I think we have uh, the most secure solution out there. Uh, but in terms of ease of use, I think we can uh, we can uh, improve improve the the, the, the experience. And uh, this is what what we are trying to do. Because as of today, if you are comfortable with uh, managing your backup, your twenty four words. If you know what is transaction, what is cryptography, what is a private key, you might be comfortable with that, and that's fine. There was, uh, there was, it's okay for you. It's okay for me. Uh, that's fine. But for newcomers, when they onboard and they see this twenty-four words, and we ask them to back up, to back up them, uh, it it can be a little bit uh, disturbing. So what do you do with those twenty-four words? Uh, do I share them with my wife? Do I? Do I put them in my house? What happens if my house burns? Like there are plenty of questions to uh, to ask yourself. Um, and and the thing is, uh, humans are not very good at managing secrets in general. Um, so <laughs> true. And for security, that that's true. Um, so it's this is not something easy. If if you are comfortable with that, if you have thought about all these questions and you have answered them uh, with your because. So often I'm asked, what do you do with your 24 hours? Uh, frankly, my threat model is not yours. Like my requir requirement with my backup are not, is not yours. So you have to uh, think about it um, uh, according to your requirement, according to what you expect, according to the value uh, you have uh, in digital assets. So this is not a simple question overall. So, And for newcomers we, who start in self-custody, it's, it can be uh, really disturbing. So what we want to offer is an option uh, for them uh, to not have to worry about this 24 hours. They onboard on the device. Uh, they are in control. Uh, they can they can do the transaction they want. Um, they they are completely in control. And if ever they lose their pin and their 24 words because they didn't want to back to back up them and so on, they have a way to uh, recover uh, their funds. And right. this is this is something important because the reality is uh, today we have uh, we and many uh, we know plenty of stories where people have lost their keys and they have lost the access to their wallets 
forever. There was nothing we can do to help them. So what we just want to do is to offer them an option. And you don't have to, if you don't like this, if you are comfortable with your setup, you, you don't have to, to use this, uh, this, this service and this product. And by the way, it's not free. So think, uh, think about it twice uh, if you want to subscribe. So this would lead me to the next questions. And we, I'm going to pull these from Twitter. And this is where the crux of the matter is. People were ticked off because they're like, hey, you said you couldn't do that. Now you're going to do that. And now all of a sudden people are like, well, wait, now that means that my mnemonic phrases and private keys, they're going to be out there for everybody because, you know, this is not what you said. So let's just jump into it. Here's the questions from Twitter. And this, I'm going to roll this in, into one question. Crypto Pragma says, ask and explain the technicalities. People can understand why this does not actually affect them. And then... Uh, Matthias Herberts, I'm pretty sure I nailed that. Why don't they solve the issue the easy way? By allowing, allowing users to disable three things from their firmware via settings, seed extraction, side loading without locked path and side loading. It's easy. The only thing that seemed to prevent them from doing so are ego or external pressure. I've had the same problem. So Charles, what about these? I, I can start with with this one. Uh, to be honest, it's already the case. Like every time you will interact with your device, every time the device will touch your key, you will be prompted uh, to uh, to accept, to consent or not for any action. So mm -hmm. if ever the uh, a recover uh, in, is, is, is initialized, a uh, recover backup is initialized, you would be prompted do you want to do this or not? If you don't want, uh, you just uh, say no, and that's it. Uh, it's uh, de deactivated by default. Like it's on you to consent to activate features, and, and it's pay. the case. Right. And pay, by the way, you start you right. start by paying, and after you activate uh, the feature on your device, and it's the case for uh, every single feature. Every time you are using your device and the device will touch one key because you have plenty of keys that are derived from the mnemonic. Every time you do that, you are asked, like, do you want to do this and this and this? And we are trying to make sure like, this is as um, easy to understand for human as possible. Uh, so that when you uh, consent for something, you understand uh, the consequences. Uh, yeah. I think the, the only um, exception to that would be blind signing on Ethereum because you have plenty of different smart contracts uh, and interacting with them. Sometimes, most of them, we are able to decode what the, the smart contract interaction will do. But sometimes there are a few uh, smart contracts that we don't support and the device is not able to uh, to understand uh, what you are about to uh, consent. And in this time, uh, you have to... Uh, to change one option in the Ethereum um, application right. to enable this blind signing, and then you will consent for uh, a hash. That's it. I have done that once before, the blind signing, blind signing. And if you ever run into that situation, Ledger has an FAQ section on their website, and you can go through it. But this was for a very specific case. And even me, I've been in, the, in, this, in this industry since 2017. And when I went through blind signing, I was like, is this going to wreck my entire ledger and I wasn't for sure I did go through with it because uh, it was a pretty I thought I felt it was a pretty safe site but again if you go down that route there is a there is a levels of risk that you have to take on so just be careful with what uh, Charles talking about as far as blind signing and that happens very rarely if you want to interact with some kind of risky stuff all right so exactly. Charles any, anything else to add on there before we get to our last question no, I, I think uh, I explained it uh, quite well. So if you don't like that feature, uh, you, you, you don't activate it. Uh, you don't consent for uh, initializing um, a backup and, and everything, uh, everything is fine. Nothing changed for you. It's the exact same situation as before. Let's say like this. Let me, let me ask you another question. Let's say that you do sign up for it. You pay 10 bucks, 999 per month. What happens in that situation? Where, do the, where does the private keys go? Does it stick with you guys or is it three places or how does that work? Okay, let me explain this one. So 
in order to um, to to use uh, the ledger recover functionality, you will have to uh, to 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 create an account uh, to mm. ledger, uh, with ledger recover. Uh, with this account, uh, you will initialize initialize some uh, identification. You will show your uh, your ID. Uh, you will go through some uh, identification process with uh, on Fido. Uh, it's a little bit like like the KYC process you have uh, on exchanges, but there is no KYC because this is not a legally. This is not a KYC. This is an identif identity uh, verification. So okay. you uh, go through this process. And then uh, when everything is set up uh, on, the, on your account, then you will initialize the process on your device. So Ledger Live will uh, prompt your device and your device will say, uh, hey, do you uh, want to initialize the backup process? Uh, then you will consent. And what will happen inside the device is uh, the following. Your mnemonic seed, not exactly the mnemonic, the, the thing just before the mnemonic, but to simplify, let's say it's the mnemonic. The mnemonic will be encrypted, then uh, sharded into uh, three different shards with a specific algorithm that is called uh, Shamir Secret Sharing. Uh, this, alg this algorithm are two interesting properties, the way we use it at least. The first one is if you have one shard, one decrypted shard, uh, you have absolutely zero information about uh, the complete seed. There is a one shard equals zero. If you have two shards out of the three, you are able to recombine uh, the full seed. So this is the way we are using uh, this algorithm. So we take the mnemonic, cut it in three, uh, we encrypted it, we cut it in three with uh, Shamir secret sharing algorithm. And then uh, we will store these shards within three different locations, three different um, uh, company in HSM. HSM is the hardware security module. This is a piece of hardware that, you, that we put in dedicated servers. And basically this is a big nano, like this is, an, this is a security enclave with that, and we store secret uh, inside the, this enclave. And there are three HSM uh, with the three uh, partners and then the encrypted shards will be sent uh, directly uh, to those uh, three partners uh, mm -hmm. using, again, an end-to-end encryption um, uh, algorithm so that even if someone is able to uh, spy the communication, everything is uh, authenticated and encrypted. Authenticated means that the device can only send to the three partners there was, there was no one can uh, create a such communication channel, uh, no one else than uh, the device and the free partners. And everything is end to end encrypted from the device directly to the HSM. So there was nothing in plain text uh, anywhere. We have chosen to have uh, three uh, different partners uh, so that um, if one fails, with the th two out of three. So if one fails, uh, that means like uh, you lose the backup, the two others are able to uh, recombine seed. We also want, wanted to have some uh, censorship resistance. Uh, so often we, we were asked what happens if a govern if one government uh, asks you to, uh, to, to access the seed, uh, that you would need at least two different governments that are located in two different um, uh, states so there was this as a mitigation. Uh, another mitigation is um, if you want, uh, if you really want to be censorship resistant against two governments, uh, you can add, you can add um, a twenty-five, a 25th word uh, to your uh, mnemonic phrase. And in all case, if you're not a terrorist, frankly, there is a very few chance that two governments uh, ask two uh, different. Uh, entities uh, to, uh, to 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 take uh, your uh, to take over your your, your assets. Man. So th this is the this is the process. And in order, so there then the backup is done. And if you want to recover, then uh, you do the same in the reverse order. You uh, log into your account. You uh, go through two different identity verification process with two uh, different partners. One is on Fido. The other is uh, Tessy. And they will send if. They recognize you, uh, you are the one you pretend to be, uh, you uh, showed your uh, identity um, uh, your identity document and everything is fine. Then they will send uh, the authorization to the HSM uh, to uh, send back the encrypted shard to your device that will recombine them inside the device. So 
you have the full picture like this. That's big. Charles, how many, time have you, how many times have you answered that question in the last two weeks? <laughs> yeah, when the way we communicated the, the feature uh, was not ideal because people discovered it uh, through um, a release note and not uh, through um, uh, like a proactive communication. Sure. And it, it created a lot of drama, as you mentioned, on Twitter, the safe place in the, in the internet. And so <laughs> I had to go through like uh, 20, I, I think 20, more than 20, 20 uh, different podcasts in order to explain this again and again. And I think that now people uh, who are, must be more aware of, uh, of the different mechanism. And in order to uh, give more uh, details about that, what we decided to do is two things. The first one is to publish the white paper of um, uh, the protocol. Like it's, it, it has been published, uh, I think, two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And it gives all the details because what I explained to you is a high level explanation of how, how it works. There is a much more details, much more uh, cryptography and so on in the white paper so that any cryptographer uh, in the world, any cryptography expert, uh, security expert can, um, can have a look. Uh, into it and give uh, give some um, some uh, feedback about that. Uh, as as of now, we had pretty good feedback uh, about that, and uh, and finally, um, uh, we will open source a, a, a big part of our firmware, the one that uh, contain the recovery functionality, so that people can uh, verify that what we implemented is the same thing uh, as uh, the is presented in the white paper. And, and finally, with the white paper, we give all the technicalities of the, of the protocol so that if you want to implement your own uh, backup provider, you can do it. It's possible because now the protocol is free. It's, uh, it's open. So you can implement your own uh, shard backup provider if you want without paying the, the 10 bucks per, per month. It won't be as convenient, but this is something you can do. Excellent. All right, it was a very uh, comprehensive answer. Thank you, Charles. And now, what, and of course, we'll get to the last question that I, that I got from Twitter, and then we'll get you out of here because I know you're a busy, busy guy. Where the hell is my stacks? You lied. Is it really ever coming? And before anybody asks, what's a stacks? This is a stacks right here. Well, your stacks yeah. is a little bit different from the Nano. It's going to be actual touchscreen, and people are pretty excited about this. So what's going on? So my stacks is right here. Well, that's good for you, Charles. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, this is uh, this is ongoing. We are uh, we are manufacturing uh, them. Um, we what 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 happened is that we had a lot of orders uh, and scaling uh, production is not something that easy. And this is uh, this is what we are uh, doing at the moment. And um, we, I'd, I'd like to be able to give you like a, um, a date, but it's coming uh, really, really soon. And frankly, this is completely transformative. Like uh, w what I was saying uh, before, like security and ease of use, like the security, I think we did a pretty good job on that. Ease of use, uh, we have a way to improve and mm -hmm. this device really improve uh, the experience. Like you have a greater screen that, that allows us to provide more information and so on. Um, you have the touch screen, which allows you to, uh, to interact with the, with the device more easily and so on. So this is ongoing. Uh, we, uh, we really would like to be able to ship uh, now. Uh, the thing is, uh, we, uh, we still have uh, to uh, scale the production, but this is, uh, this is ongoing. And, um, and, and by the way, uh, during this uh, recover drama thing, like uh, uh, I, I remember that Trezor and a few others did uh, some advertising uh, around that. Oh, yeah. This is, this is, the, this is normal. I, I, I'm, fine, I'm fine with that. But in a matter of a few days, they, they were completely out of stock. Like what I want to say is like we have like different scale of um, production and we have different challenges than, than there's, uh, there's um, competitors. Let's say I, I don't feel that they are competitors, but yeah, you, you get what, what I mean. So yeah, scaling production, scaling manufacturing uh, is not something that easy. Uh, and, uh, and we are about to, uh, to nail it for uh, stacks. Sounds like a plan. I got to tell you, I know people are waiting for this, but if uh, if you guys get this out before the Cybertruck that I ordered two and a half years ago, 
If you beat that, fantastic, because uh, I don't think that's ever coming. So this yeah. will lead me to, to my next question, because we had talked about this uh, offline first, which is, and we'll get into some other technical parts of the ledger, but where's blockchain going in general? And we're talking about, I mean, you can talk about L0s, L1s, and L2s, but where is it going? Where do we see things moving? Because right now, I don't think the adoption is quite there like we'd like to see it. Where are we moving to as you see it as a CTO? Yes. Um, so what we, what we saw in the different uh, bull market and bear market, because uh, there are some, uh, some cycles uh, into that, uh, in, the, in the previous uh, bull market, like with plenty of uh, money flowed uh, in, in, the, in the ecosystem, a lot of new projects appeared and so on. And quite quickly, we noticed that the current blockchain design we have do not scale. Uh, especially mm. if we, if you take into account uh, Ethereum, uh, Ethereum where you can uh, like execute some code. On, on Bitcoin, it's a little bit different uh, because uh, you don't expect too many things from the blockchain. You only expect like store of value, and th this is essentially it. But even for uh, Bitcoin, when you, when you have a lot of transactions per second, uh, like fees um, uh, skyrocket because the blockchain can't handle too many transactions. But on Ethereum, what we expect from the blockchain is to uh, compute programs like you want to have um, uh, trustless programs that are executed by the blockchain in a trustless manner in a verifiable manner and so on so you you need to have um, something quite scalable and during the last bull market we saw very quickly that uh, the the ethereum blockchain doesn't scale because even with uh, some small nft project as soon as there, there was a new NFT project, like the fees just was were just skyrocketing, just because uh, there was an auction mechanism uh, to uh, make your transaction inserted in the blockchain, and the blockchain um, uh, capacity uh, is limited. So, exactly. yeah, this is this is a very good uh, graph uh, to explain this. So. In order to solve this problem, we need to uh, solve the scalability challenge you have on the blockchains. Uh, mm -hmm. But you can't uh, solve this problem alone because uh, there is what we call the blockchain trilemma. Like there is a security. Security is important for a blockchain also. If you if you can't trust the blockchain itself, uh, you, you, you won't solve anything. Then you have uh, decentralization. Uh, you want the blockchain to be quite decentralized, otherwise, um, you, you, you won't be uh, censorship resistant, and this is uh, something important, and you want it to be uh, scalable. And as of today, uh, blockchains are quite secure, let's say, um, quite decentralized, but not that much um, uh, scalable. So the question is how uh, can we exactly, the scalability trilemma, uh, the, the question is how can we keep the security and decentralization property but also solve the scalability challenge. Like if you are, if you want to have an ID um, on Ethereum, you can process around like 15 uh, transactions per second. 15. It's not that much. If no. you imagine billions of users using this blockchain, it does not scale. Even uh, like Visa is uh, uh, several orders of magnitude more scalable than this. And we want like to be able to implement use cases as Visa. A Visa is a simple use case. We should be uh, we should be able to uh, implement um, uh, this use case on blockchains. So the question is, how can we do that while keeping um, uh, again very good a very good example like uh, Visa is twenty four thousand transaction per second. Ethereum is 15 or 20. So the, we are far from uh, Visa. And Visa is very simple. We are not talking about uh, computing some uh, automated market maker as Uniswap on Visa. Visa is really more simple than this. But Ethereum can't handle Visa right at the moment. So the question is, how can we do that? Uh, and there is a lot of research uh, ongoing for a few years now, especially on the Ethereum uh, community. And as of today, I think the most promising uh, solution to that is layer two. And uh, there are different um, um, different implementation for layer two. You have optimistic rollup, but also um, um, validity rollup that use uh, zero knowledge proof uh, uh, technology. I won't yes. enter too much in the details, but the idea is to have another layer, another blockchain uh, where you will create 
a new set of rules uh, to the transaction. And then you will be able to do as many transactions per second as you want. Like this is a, there was no real issue in terms of uh, scalability. And then you have uh, some computer, big computer that will um, create a proof that the new state of this blockchain is valid. It, it won't give all the states um, uh, to, the, to the layer one, but just a proof that this state is valid. And on the Ethereum blockchain, the layer one, uh, you implement some uh, smart contract. And this smart contract is only able to verify that the proof is correct and the state is valid. This is the only thing that uh, the, the smart contract is able to do. And this, this smart contract uh, costs some gas, more gas than a simple transaction, but you factor all the transaction of the layer two into one transaction on the layer one. So this is quite magical. And I think this is how we will solve the scalability challenge on, on, uh, on Ethereum, for instance. I have to agree. Hopefully, layer two solutions will be the next thing, the, the next big thing, Arbitrum. And of course, my favorite Polygon because it's my favorite because I invested into it. <laughs> and look, that's, uh, that is uh, me being as transparent as I possibly can. I am a bag holder, so I am uh, super uh, excited about that. All let right. Me, let, let me give a few others which are quite interesting as well. Uh, ZK Sync is another. And uh, Starkware with uh, Starknet is also an interesting one with uh, different technology. All of these projects are very interesting. Excellent. Uh, Anyhow, Charles, I, I want to say thanks for coming on the show. I know people are a little bit uh, disgruntled about what's going on, but I think it's going to take time. And I got to tell you, to get the mass adoption effect, let's be honest. I mean, the OGs like us and the people you watch in this video, you're a different breed. The people that are coming in, they're going to need a little bit different. And then maybe we can kind of onboard them like baby steps before they actually do the full self-custody. I think that's what, we're, what it's all about. So, Charles, any last words of wisdom? Um, maybe a last word about like what, what you just said. It really reminds me the beginning of the Internet. Uh, and yeah. I guess you, you remember those times. Okay. Everything was really complex. Uh, you had to understand network to uh, connect your modem. You, you, everything was really complex. And from this moment to now, like the technology did a, a great progress. Like the user experience is better. Mm -hmm. And also people get better. Also, they, they started to understand how internet works and so on. Mm -hmm. They also uh, understood that it's not only for uh, pedophile and, uh, <laughs> and terrorists. And terrorists. Uh, that's true. <laughs> and we, we, did, we did this journey with, uh, with the web in a matter of like 20, 25 years, maybe. Mm -hmm. If you remember the end of the 90s, that was really the beginning uh, of the mass adoption. Uh, but when you think about that, when you think about this time, uh, we, the journey was really long and everything changed completely from the experience you had on the internet in 1998, let's say, and the one we have today, like nothing is, is the same, like everything changed. And you, you, we are, uh, we are early adopters uh, in crypto, but let's remind that uh, we are at the very beginning and the, the crypto that we know today is really, really different from the crypto that will uh, be in 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, it's difficult to imagine this new world, but it will be really different. The UX will be really better. And, uh, and the thing that we think are, won't ever change, might change a little bit. And this is uh, this is uh, normal. This is how things uh, um, like innovation and progress is uh, is um, is important, and uh, it happens at the end. Exactly. And if you and for you watching the video, if you can remember something like this, you already have that sound off in your head. Look how far we've come in that amount of time. So Charles, again. Thank you so much for, for stopping by. We appreciate it. Everybody, if you're looking for the links of all the things we just talked about, they'll be in the description. And of course, you can find the ledger uh, links also in the description. Charles, once again, thank you so much. I think that answers it. So appreciate it. Thank you, Rob. All right, everybody. That's it. We'll jump back. All right, so that's it. So uh, just like we talked about, I think that uh, people like you and me, uh, we are okay with custody, self-custody. I think the people that are coming in may not be as comfortable doing that. And of course, we've seen people uh, lose their keys before. 
I think moving forward, it is on, on us to educate everyone why self custody is so important and not have a recovery type of service, but that's on us to educate everyone. So that is it for today. If you liked today's video, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing. This is not a set it and forget it type of market. You really should be up to date about what's going on, but that's it for today. So thanks so much for stopping by. I do appreciate you and I'll see you on the next one.